How you doing, sir? Hey, Good to see you, man. You too. Long time. Yeah. You still coaching? I'm still coaching. Excellent. You look like you're in shape, too. Yeah. I'm going to back to the city. Test one, test two. All right, well, everybody, welcome. And it's, it's official. This is our last time together in these candidate forums. So and it's wonderful to have you here with us tonight. We are also very pleased to have with us Dr. Sandy Womack. Uh, he's currently with the Columbus City Schools. Yes, sir. And so he's going to be here with us to share quite a bit of information. We're looking forward to hearing all of that. So um, give her. For everybody out there in the room, I'm Steve working with the Ohio School Boards Association, and it's been my pleasure to work with the board through this process. Uh, it's been, I, th I think we're in the home stretch of So um, with that said, as I've done every night, uh, although I think Dr. Womack knows a lot of people in the room, um, we'll start over here at the far corner um, and give you a chance to just introduce yourself very quickly. My name is Kelly Taylor, parents and alumni. Officer on ETA and other various boards. Pleased to be here. Good to see you, Phil. Good to see you. Well, hi, I'm Lynn Swoop, and um, final night. And for the all of us that have been in the room for the four nights, I think you guys probably feel like me. We know we do this every night. We needed our own slide show, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I am Acker alumni, graduated from Firestone High School. I am a parent of a middle school student at STEM High School. For the last 18 years, I have been at Old Trail School um, with my children. I was on school board at Old Trail School. Still have one child there. Uh, she'll probably likely end up maybe at STEM also once she's done at Old Trail. Um, just happy to be back when I have to tell you also. Good to see you, ma'am. My name is Andrea West. I am a parent and a Hopeville uh, alumni. I also serve my PTA at Hopeville High School as a secretary. Good to see you, Mr. Brown. Also, I'm also um, once again here. Um, in fact, I'm president of the PTA at this particular time. I've been involved in various projects with that. Thank you. We have a 12th grade. Yes. <laughs> Good to see you, Mr. Brown. Kemp Boyd, executive director of Love Akron, also head football coach at Kimmel Garfield High School. Good to see you, Mr. Boyd. Thanks for being here. Hello, Geeky Journal. Table 12. Coach Derek, I'm um, Black Bob School, alumni, Kimmel High School. Um, owner operator, HY Academy, in the city um, training facility, and also in the state licensing official. Good to see you, Jerry. Thank you. Alexis Schuller, um, I have one at Kimmel Garfield and one at Bridges, which is one of our alternative schools. And I am the Kilmore Garfield Cluster Advisor for the Acting Council of PTAs. Good to see you, Laura Dees, Acting Public School Retiree, Project Grant Boundary Executive Director Retiree. Boss. 
<laughs> Anna Holland, I'm with the National Inventors Hall of Fame and um, sit on the executive committee for the National Inventors Hall of Fame STEM Middle School and High School. That's me, okay. Demetrius Falconer, mother of four, that has gone in and out of the system currently. The last one is at Miller South School of Visual and Performing Arts and Chief of Community Engagement for Summit Metroplex. That's me. Thank you. I have three daughters. One is at Akron Early College and is a sophomore. I do serve on the Akron Early College PTA. And then I have twins. One is at Akron uh, Miller South School for Performing Arts, and the other twin is at Our Lady of the Nice to meet you, man. I think you got everybody. Thank you all for sharing. And as we have done uh, every night, we are going to allow Dr. Womack to share with us his vision for Akron, and then we're going to dive into questions. So I'll turn the floor over to you. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I know there's a variety of different places that you could have been in, but the fact that you took some time to come to hear what I have to say about my vision for the Akron Public Schools means a lot to me. Um, as you said, we can always get a little bit more money, but it's hard to find time. And the fact that you took time out of your day to be here, um, I'm appreciative of this. Um, on the slides, you can see um, my vision for Akron is very simply this. We are Akron, and we is always greater than me. Um, I do not believe in the great leaders theory that great leaders do and great leaders don't. What I do believe is that great leaders develop great teams. And when you develop a great team, that always means that we is greater than me. I don't believe that one person can turn around or transform an entire educational school system. I don't believe that one person can turn around and transform an entire system to begin with. I believe what you have to do is create leadership and create teams and collaborations in order to make that happen. And as parents of the community, you are the most vital resource that we have here point blank because if your kids don't come to our schools, then we don't have people to operate because the enrollment drives what goes on with funding, and it also drives what goes on with parent satisfaction. We need kids. It's important that we provide them with a quality education. As a school principal, I've always stated that it's important that our kids know a few things. Can they read well? Can they write well? Can they speak well? And most importantly, can they critically think? But as a building principal, it was my responsibility to do a couple things, not only to make sure that that took place, but also to ensure that they had a safe and secure learning environment. I'm a parent as well. I have three daughters. And one of the things I've always tried to focus on with my principals is very simply this. Make sure that teaching and learning takes place every day to the best of our students' ability and make sure that those kids are safe. And I felt like as a parent, if you take care of those two things right there, that is a solid foundation. Because as a parent, I want to ensure that my kids are learning and that they're safe. And I look at it from the administrator role working in central office as the principal is the mayor of that city. They're responsible for the things that take place within their spectrum or their span of control. As a superintendent of schools, it's my job to hold them accountable for that, working in a variety of different departments that I may be able to work for. So although I will not be teaching a class, it's important that I know that teaching is taking place. Although I won't be safety and security in the building, it's important that I know safety and security is taking place within your school. And I give them and work with them collectively with the autonomy, recognizing that we is always greater than me, and we are Akron. So I give you that caveat because I'm a former elementary school principal um, at Lake Elementary School in Canton, Ohio. I'm a former middle school assistant principal at Jennings Middle School here in the Akron Public Schools, a dean of students at Glover's Elementary School, principal at Hartford Middle School, in the Kansas City schools, where we able to take the building from academic emergency to effective ranking, moving that school from an F to a B in the course of three years. We also developed specific community engagement partnerships by doing what we call the Hartford Collaborative Model, which was founded by a gentleman by the name of Mr. George Dunwoody. May he rest in peace. But as an elementary school principal at Lakeland Elementary School, we took that building from academic emergency, which was an F, and got it to continuous improvement over the course of four or five years. But we had a specific model that we used called a collaborative model, which meant parents were in our building, businesses, organizations, and I give you specific examples. When I was at Lakeland, we partnered with the Stark Social Workers Network. We partnered with Mercy Medical, I mean, not Mercy Medical Center. It was Altman Hospital. We partnered with the Greater Stark County Urban League. We 
partnered with the city council person at that time who was Chris Smith. We partnered with um, Fisher Foods and Iron Rock. And all of those companies came into our buildings at least once a month to sit down and say, what can we do collaboratively in order to make sure that the students that we serve are safe, that they're learning, and we provide them access to experiences as well as exposure. It was an elementary school principal. My students visited over 30 different college campuses. As fifth graders or as fourth graders, they were at Walsh University. They were at Malone College. They were at Mount Union. They were at Stark State. They were at Akron U. They were at Youngstown State. Because I'm going to ask you a very simple question if you see it on my slide. The question is, how many of you were told to get a good education by a show of hands? And you probably want it for your own children. But my question to you is this, what is a good education? So I don't know if you're allowed to talk from table to table or person to person, but realistically, in the next 30 seconds, what is a good education? So give me a few seconds to think about that because almost everybody has been told to get a good education, but what is a good education? With well, a thing that we are accurate and we are greater than me. As you ponder what is a good education and think about it, I'll reflect back on that during this presentation. One of the things that I found out as being a leader in education and also serving in six different urban school districts over the course of my tenure is that mindset matters. Um, being a product of Akron Public Schools, moving over 16 times before I was 16 years old, staying in North Akron, West Akron, Canton, Ohio, East 68th Street in Chicago, and living in all those different places, I began to understand that some of the teachers that I worked with didn't have the highest expectations for me because they looked at my situation and circumstances and said, there's no way that this young man can make it. But I began to understand that mindset matters. And as a leader of a school district with the focus of we is greater than me, and we also have to recognize that it's my job to model the way. And I can't model that way if I don't have the mindset to believe that it's never how you start, it's how you finish. And expectations do matter. My goal in working with the Akron Public School staff is very simply this. We all play a role in the success or failure of each school and every school. Everybody in here, we all play a role in the success or failure of each student at every school. It's imperative that my staff understand that they have a vested interest in the success or failure of the students that they work with. And we follow the model at the schools that I work with called five times seven. I'll talk a little bit about that in a few seconds. My second expectation in regards to talking about that mindset matters is this. We all have a vested interest in the Akron community. So the better that we do, the better the community does. And I've also found out if you can reach the kids, then we can help the next generation. Because if two is one of my favorite rappers always said, there's no hope for the kids, no hope for the youth, and there's no hope for the future. And so we all have a vested interest in the African community, starting with our kids. The last thing is that we as a staff must demonstrate a level of commitment and effort through our action. If we are going to make a significant difference in regards to the education of the students that we serve, it must be demonstrated through the actions, our commitment, and our effort. And I recognize that as an educator, that there are only 24 hours in a day. And we ask teachers to do a significant amount of work beyond education. A teacher's job, in most cases, folks, is to make sure that teaching and learning occurs. That teaching, not that I taught and you didn't learn it, but that teaching and learning occurs. As my uncle told me, I have not taught until the lesson has been learned. But I don't want you to have to be the social worker. I don't want you to have to be the nurse. I don't want you to have to be the best friend. What I want you to do is be able to focus on instruction. And when I talked about the collaborative model that we use, we partnered with the Star Social Workers Network because we had kids and families who were in need of the HEAT program the food program, the energy assistance program, job training programs with the Greater Stark County Urban League. My schools and my teachers weren't equipped to do that, but there were people who focused on that, which means I needed those people in my building. We partnered with mental health services and minority behavioral health services here out in Summit County in order to help us when we got to Hartford because we had kids who struggled with coping skills, 
They were dealing with adverse childhood experiences. They were dealing with trauma. As the principal of Hartford Middle School, we buried quite a few kids during my time there because of gang warfare going on between unit and rating. My staff was not equipped to handle that. But guess what? Kurt Williamson and other people, minority behavior health services were. So they were all a part of our collaborative because it really does take the village, which is why I always say we is greater than me. But I talked to you about what's called five times seven. And the reason I say five times seven is this. My goal for every teacher that worked in my building was to be in school five days a week and to give me your best seven hours. The other 17 hours, all I said is keep us out the newspaper. And so my goal, number one, was for you to be able to focus for seven hours on these students that are in front of you just like they are your kids. And that would be an expectation that I have for every principal that I would work with, all of our staff members, is to give me a commitment to the kids that we are serving on a day-to-day, -day, five days a week, seven hours a day. And if you give me extra, I appreciate it because the difference between extraordinary and ordinary is extra. And I have some staff members who are willing to stay longer in order to facilitate and keep our schools open to do things that they were interested in. In order to make some of the transformational changes that we were able to make in regards to academic achievement in our schools, we followed the model that you see here. And I call it the TRIO model, which entails the schools, the families, and the communities coming together collectively in order to meet the needs of the school. But everybody finds a lane. You see, I can't tell a parent how to raise their kids, just like many parents have a difficulty telling the teacher how to instruct their kids. But at the same time, I know that we need that partnership, so we have to be able to communicate. I also recognize that there are many assets in the community. And so therefore, if we can get the hospitals, and we get the social service agencies, and we can get the job training programs, and we can get the social emotional health programs, and we can get colleges and universities, and we can get businesses, which of course, in many cases, Akron already has partnerships with, with the college and career academies. How do we get them to come together to utilize them successfully so everybody can play their own lane, but at the same time, keeping a focus on the kids that we serve? And these are the type of things that we have to do collectively because as I said before, we is always greater than me. I can't do it by myself. My principals can't do it by themselves, but collectively the staff members that we have focusing on this model will be able to help us improve the academic outcomes of the students that we serve on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you as parents are not happy with what goes on, you have choices today. You have options today. There are vouchers, there are charter schools, you can take your students elsewhere. So we collectively have to make sure that we demonstrate an effort each and every day that the success or failure of each and every one of these students and each one of these schools is directly reflective of the effort that we make each and every day to ensure that instruction is taking place in schools. I base this model on what I learned through Rutgers University. So when I became an elementary school principal, I was, I got it at 29, I took the job at 30. So I was young, I didn't even know what I didn't know. But I went to the National Alliance of Black School Educators Conference and Rutgers University was there. And the lady was talking to me about this community wraparound model. So they had a parent pantry, they had GED programs, they had financial literacy programs, they had housing help so the parents could learn how to get houses. They were doing all of these things in this elementary building. They were connected to a university. And so as a result of it, they were seeing phenomenal growth. And I was at a school where only 2% of the kids were passing the fourth grade math test and 17% of the kids were passing the fourth grade reading test. Over the course of five years, that 2% in math went up to 63% in math. Over the course of the next five years, that 17% in reading went up to over 73% in reading. But I believe a lot of it was based on that community wraparound model because we were able to bring parents in and we have partners in order to deal with the social, emotional, and the job training and things that our parents needed so my teachers could really just focus on instruction. And we had resources, not because they came in, but because we knew each other by name. I know that's Bear Jordan. I know that's Joe Parrish. I know that's Glenn Watts. I knew them because we all worked together collectively and we met in that building every month in addition to what they were doing after school in order to support us. We carried that same model to Hartford Middle School, we were able to keep that school open to 8 o'clock every night 
type of what Catholic public schools are trying to do with community learning centers in order to provide the programs and the resources necessary to ensure that the teachers can focus on teaching and those agencies can focus on what they did best in order to meet the needs of our kids. Public schools already has college and career academies. And one of the things that I say is many of these partnerships have already been started. You have Akron Children's Hospital, First Energy, Kent State, Goodyear, Applied Engineering, Bridgestone, Firestone, Key Bank, Huntington Bank, Summa Healthcare, um, Academy of Global Technology and Business. There are several partnerships that are already established in the college and career pathways. How do we leverage these partnerships in order to do something that I would like to see happen in Akron that I have not seen anywhere else? One of the things I think we need to do in addition to teach kids to read, write, speak, and most importantly, critically think, is to include financial literacy and investment education at the early ages, starting in elementary schools. Because if our kids can read well, if they can write well, if they can speak well, and they can critically think, if they know how to say please and thank you and yes sir and yes ma'am, excuse me, and I apologize, and we equip them with the skills to have financial literacy and investment education at a young age, ladies and gentlemen, that sets them ahead of almost everything going on in the curve. Because I know a lot of people who can make money, but can you keep it? I know a lot of people who understand they have high paying jobs, but their credit is so bad that they're paying 24 and 25% interest. And if we would learn at a young age how to invest our money, how we can become familiar with financial literacy, how we can balance a checkbook, what that looks like when you see a check that should be $1,000, but they're taking out FICA, they're taking out Medicare, they're taking out Social Security, now your check is $632, but you were budgeting on 1000 and didn't know it, how do we do that? Why would you put $100 in savings and no disrespect intended to savings and get $1 at the end of the year when you might be able to invest in something like Walmart or McDonald's and get a dividend every quarter so that therefore that money continues to grow? Nobody taught me that. Those are things that I had to learn later on in life. And if I'd have got that foundation early on, I believe it would have helped me early. We did have class at Portage Path that talked to us about a budget and checks and balances, but it definitely didn't explain to me interest equal prime rate and time, it didn't explain to me about credit, and those are some of the things that I believe if we can plant those seeds early and tie that into these college and career academies and these business partnerships that we have, then we give them a tangible pathway in order to help us in addition to what they're doing, because I don't know if this has been clearly defined due to the fact that these partnerships are fairly new. The college and career pathways just started in 2017, moved in 2018, then we had COVID. So everybody's still trying to find their lane. But one of the things that I would like to do here in Akron, if given this opportunity, is to ensure that we have this type of education going on. And it could be through the business partnerships or the outside service and vendors who provide this type of education for students. Earlier in this game, I asked you, what is a good, or why were you told to get a good education? Excuse me, or what is a good education? But I believe the real question is this. Why were you told to get education? I believe we're told to get a good education for this reason. If you don't ask the right questions, you will not get the right answer. So I asked you what is a good education, but I believe the question really should be why. And this is why many people were told to get a good education. Because education and income in the United States of America go hand in hand, not by accident, but by design. To deny yourself access to education is to deny yourself access to income. And as a result of that, that means that we need to equip our kids with a quality education. And I'm not saying everybody is going to college, but you need a skill, a trade, a craft, something beyond high school. But first of all, we gotta get you across the finish line in high school. In the state of Ohio in 2015 was ranked 49 out of 50 states in regards to the graduation rate of African-American students, with a 59.7% graduation rate. That's here in the state of Ohio. 49 out of the 50 states, Ohio was ranked, excuse me, Ohio was ranked 49 out of the 50 states in regards to the graduation rate for African-American students in 2015. Folks, education and income go hand in hand, not by accident, by design. 
So when we talk to our kids about what is a good education, we also have to talk to them about why. Because education gives you choices, chances, and options. And I'm a living example of it, folks. I sat into a college classroom and they said, name a gas, I said unleaded. They said, name a number, I said premium. I'm standing here today and my name is Dr. Sandy Womack because I began to understand the importance of reading, writing, speaking, and critical thinking and the difference that education could make in your life by seeing examples of my friends who didn't have. And so as a result, I have a vested interest in regards to what goes on with these kids because I made a commitment to this community a commitment to God that I will do everything I can in order to ensure that urban education kids are doing well, they understand the importance of education, they will be exposed to experiences outside of their neighborhoods and their classrooms to make this relevant. Because I know the difference that it makes. What I need is equity, engagement, and working towards achievement, which is some of the things that the Board of Education and African Public School have made as tenants to their foundations or their pillars. But in order to address equity as an equity and diversity trainer for the last 20 plus years, one of the things I have to recognize is the first thing you have to deal with in equity is this. Acknowledge that inequities exist. We can't talk about equity when we talk about the inequities that are already occurring in regards to what's going on. And what I see in Akron is what's called a tale of two cities. I see schools that have 100% graduation rate. I see schools that have access to STEM education. I see schools that have access to AP programs. And then I look across the street and see a school that has one AP program, where another has six or seven, or a school that has no AP program. Or I see schools that have high graduation rates, or another school that's graduating 75% of their students. We have to address the inequities that we see already within the system. And that's why I say we is greater than me because I can't do that by myself. That's going to take the schools, the families, and the communities coming together under a collective effort to ensure that our kids are getting the education that they need to be successful. But I also need this. We also need this. Not I. We. We need feedback from the community stakeholders. People like yourself in order to give us input on how we're doing and progressing towards our plan. Akron City Schools has created a phenomenal plan in regards to the college and career academies. I believe that it's a magnificent concept in regards to what goes on, but can it be enhanced? Yes. Can we refine it? Yes. But most importantly, we have to see if what we have in place is actually working. And with that being the case, we need feedback from all of our stakeholders in order to see if we're actually meeting your needs. Because you are taxpayers, and as a result of it, you have input and say so in regards to what we do. The last thing I say is if we truly want to be, which is the goal I've heard of Dr. James and Mrs. McWilliams and the Akron Public Schools, the top performing urban education school system in the nation, then we've got to increase the current levels of performance. There's no doubt about it. We have to in order to attract kids to our building. We have to also look at doing different things with our amenities and our facilities in order to make people say, I want to come to your school. Not only because of the name, but because I look at it and it's something that I want my kids to be a part of. And this will require collaboration between the Board of Education and their support, aligning budgets, a clear vision and teamwork, and a commitment to ensuring a servant mentality and a focus on students. As I said before, our formula was pretty simple. Five days a week, seven hours a day, intently focused on the kids that we serve every day to ensure that teaching and learning is taking place and to ensure that your kids are in a safe learning environment. It is my job, if I'm chosen to be Akron Public School Superintendent, to be able to listen. And not to listen like my daughters do, where are going one ear and out the other, but to actively listen, to take notes, to get feedback to get committees together in order to sit down and talk about where do we want to go in comparison to where we are right now. i got to be able to listen. And I haven't been in African public schools in 20 years. So I don't have my ear to the ground and know everything that is going on within this community or within these schools. I can do research, but that's only information on paper. I have to be willing to listen. I also have to be willing to lead and learn. The one reason I continue to go to school to get a quality education is because I believe I need to continue to learn more. When you stop learning, you stop living. So I'm learning more and more each and every day. And the more I know, the 
the more I recognize I don't know. But I can't lead this district, and we can't do this collectively unless I'm willing to listen, and I'm willing to learn, and I'm willing to lead. Um, it's 2021. It would be almost impossible not to have a slide to deal with the thing or the pink elephant in the room. COVID became a great rebuilding. We have kids who were not able to come to school for almost eight to nine months. We have some people who had access to technology and other people who struggled with connectivity. And as a result of it, we had to deal with learning loss. But the reality of the situation is COVID provided something that education has probably been needed for the last 50, 60 years. We need to have some change. We needed to find a way to adapt and adjust to the market and the customer that we serve. And that means we had to enhance our use of technology. And what we found out was there's new methods of instruction. Colleges and universities have been doing online instruction for years. It took public education to have COVID for us to focus on something that some of the charter schools have been doing for the last 15, 16 years. And although we may not have been able to do it as effectively as we like, we have to start providing professional development for those staff members who we may know at any given time may have to go back to this, depending on how this virus spreads itself or whatever else is going on. So we found new methods of instruction, which require professional development for our teachers to effectively meet the needs of your kids in this environment. Should they have to go back or should they have to have a four period schedule with one period schedule specifically in order to do online instruction for those kids who chose to stay online? We have to put a priority on health and safety. Look at how you're socially distanced right now. When 2021, 2022 comes back, Will we be able to have kids stacked on top of each other? Or will we only be able to have 20 kids in the classroom? What does that look like for staffing? What does that look like for health and safety and PPE devices? We have to talk to the people who are known for departments and CDC, Ohio Department of Health, to get input on what this is going to look like for 2021, 2022, because right now, folks, we just don't know. And what we also found out with COVID in addition to social justice and social activism, as a result of the things we saw when we were all at home because we couldn't go anywhere, we were under quarantine, is that Zoom, WebEx, Google Classroom became a new, a new means of communicating with parents. We have parents who would never come into the school for parent-teacher conference, but they show up on a Zoom conference on a constant basis, and that was a way to have a conversation with their two-way communication. So how do we use this as a tool to engage our parents and get student voice? Finally, as I wrap up, let's see if this works here. Um, what I found in public education over the years that I've been a part of it is very simply this. Um, I've paid my dues, I've cut my teeth, I've played almost every role in public education that you can play. I've been a director of curriculum and instruction, I've been a director of school improvement. I've been a director of pupil services. And not only been a director, been effective in those positions. I've been a director of pupil leadership, principal leadership and development, the equity task force, the middle school principal, an alternative high school principal, or elementary school principal, anything in public education you talk about other than superintendent, and I'm an area superintendent now, I'll pay my dues. This has never been easy. That's why I say we is greater than me. Over the course of my lifetime in public education, what I found out is saying Womack could not do it by itself. There's no way, shape, form, possibility that would ever happen. But I know when we come together collectively, we can make tremendous change. And I base it on my belief, and my belief statement comes from Dr. Ron Edmonds, who is the leader of the Effective School Movements, who said very simply, we can, whenever and wherever we choose, successfully teach all children whose schooling is of interest to us. We already know more than we need to do this. Whether we do it or not must finally depend on how we feel about the fact that we have not done it so far. Folks, that's about expectations. And Dr. Ron Evans was saying right there that the fact that we have not, is nothing to do about the information that we have, is the fact that we have chosen not to do anything about it. Final two slides. As a student at Mount Union College, I met a gentleman by the name of Dr. Ben Yohanna my first year in college. I was struggling. As I said before, name a gas, unleaded. Name another gas, premium. He said, name a disabilitating disease or illness that causes the body to malfunction. 
I raised my hand and said, sugar. He said, Sandy, there is no disease called sugar. I said, yes, it is. My aunt got sugar. My uncle got sugar. My cousin got sugar. But what he eventually did say is very simply this. Tell me about sugar. Auntie take a shot. Uncle lost his foot. Other aunt went blind. That sounds like diabetes. I argued with the man and said, no, he didn't. Because I knew sugar, not diabetes. This picture came on our campus. And he said to me, who invented the three, who wrote the three musketeers? I said, Shakespeare. He said, you know. He said, who invented the light bulb? I said, Edison. He said, you know. I said, you don't get $10,000 to talk and don't know that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. He asked the question, how did Moses know that he was wrong when he killed the slave driver? When didn't he bring down the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai? I said, well, my grandma didn't go get on you, man, because I know you're not challenging Moses. But the reality of the situation is, it made me think, and I was on a college campus. He told me that that light bulb that we see was invented by a black man by the name of Lewis Latterman. He showed me a picture of Lewis Latterman in a patent that said electric light bulb. He produced a carbon filament to make it work. I never knew a black man invented anything but a peanut. I had no idea. He told me that the Three Musketeers was written by Alexander Dumas, who was also black. I thought all classic English literature was written by Shakespeare. I didn't know that. He also told me that Goshen was in Egypt and Egypt was in Africa. I didn't know that. And what he showed me is that education mattered. I was not taking education seriously because I didn't see myself in the curriculum. African public schools is over 50% African American. We need to make sure the halls, the walls, the curriculum, the information that our kids see in those buildings when they had that high concentration of African American students reflect themselves in the curriculum. One of the things that we saw to help us turn around in schools was not only the partnerships that we had, we found a way to connect the curriculum to the students that we serve. And so when you see a building that has those type of different graphics, how do we find a way to connect the curriculum? Not only do we provide them exposure and experiences, we try to find a way to make sure that they see themselves in the curriculum. Because if it does not connect, then most times the kids are not going to pay attention to it. He said something that made it connect. And that's why I believe it's very important that we ensure that we have a curriculum that connects to the students we serve. Finally, my why. My why is very simple with this, before we get into it. My why is because I made a commitment over 25 years ago to do what my grandmother said. She said, saying if you just behave, you're going to be all right. And that says a lot. And she meant that because she knew I had one foot in the streets and one foot in the school. And she said, I want you to just behave. And I made a commitment later on because of the situation and circumstance to say, Lord, if you get me up out of this, I promise I'm going to focus on educating inner city kids to make sure that they understand the importance of a quality education and what opportunities and choices that it gives you. I live a lifestyle that I never thought I would ever experience. Not because I'm rich and wealthy, because I had the options and the choices to do things for my family I never thought I'd be able to do. Not because I'm the best person in the world, but because I had a quality education. The Lord blessed me, and I began to listen to my grandmother, saying, just behave. So my why for wanting this position and to be able to come back into Africa is because this is where I cut my teeth. This is where I started. This is where Dr. Smalls gave me a chance. This is where Conrad Ott drove me back and forth in the Chevy Blazer to meet Dr. Barbara Smith and talk to me about the importance of what he learned as a superintendent. Didn't know why he was saying anything to me. This is where I went to Bookville High School, Perkins Middle School, Finley Elementary School, Portage Path. I would like to be able to make that type of difference here because folks, if I don't do it here, I'm going to continue to do it wherever I am. I focus on urban education. This is the sixth urban district that I work in, and I would love to have the opportunity. But as I said before, we is always greater than me. And it's not what is a good education, but why do we talk about a good education? And I believe it's important that everybody knows this. You have to get it. This is called, how do I know? And a lot of times when people hear the phrase, how do I know, the next thing they say is what? I don't know what. But the key really isn't to know what. The key is to know why. Because when you know your why, you have options on what your what can be. For instance, my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. My what is stand-up comedy. 
My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular I'm about to show you a clip to. We were in, uh, we in Winston-Salem. So Break Time, this is how it works. I travel the country, I do stand-up comedy, probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music. You know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just going to show you a clip. Check it. So you're a musical director? Yes, sir. All right, so... Um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Get to the first part of that. Go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow, that rock is sick. You know what I'm saying? version is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. You know which version I'm talking about. Just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing sharing that. Now let's let's get to the questions that have been submitted here. So uh, I'm going to start with this one. All of the buildings were redesigned as CLCs, community learning centers. How do you envision the role of these hubs realistically extending to offer health and social services or arts and culture, cultural programming to the community in the aftermath of the pandemic? I think, first of all, we have to be concerned about the safety and security and what goes on in regards to the health and safety of the students. Get information from the Center for Disease Control. Get information from the Ohio Department of Health in regards to what we can actually do. That would be the first thing. The second thing is I've already seen how this worked. I've been blessed to have an opportunity at Hartford Middle School and Lakeland Elementary School, and most importantly, Hartford, to see what an actual community learning center looked like. Our building was open from 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock in the morning to 7.30 every evening from Monday till Friday. And what we actually had was social service agencies that were within our building. We had adult education programs in our building. We had after school dance training in regards to uh, adult computer classes. We had Wednesday night Bible study. We had financial and investment literacy classes within our class brought in from people who were willing to work there in order to help support. As a, master, as a matter of fact, um, had, certain, or had church in our schools on Saturday at the word church, and he had Wednesday night Bible studies, but he also brought in the financial literacy piece for the people in the community because the building was open to 7.30 every night during the week. We also had access to um, adult computer classes, line dance classes. We had performing arts. Nick Spindell was teaching people how to play the guitar. Chuck Bocher was teaching kids after school culinary arts. Our buildings were open. 
And so the airport brought people in and we were able to use that as a hub. So I know what community learning centers can actually look like, but we would have to come together collectively to find out within every neighborhood what that looks like for those neighborhoods. Because I don't know what Ennis wants to look like versus what Jennings wants to look like versus what Litchfield wants to look like versus what Hire wants to look like. We have to be able to sit down collectively and those principles to meet your community stakeholders and say, hey, these are the things that we would like to see. How can we fund it? What is the process for people to get into the building? What are the assurances that are needed? And if there are some things that prohibit that, then find a way to take down some of those barriers that are preventing those buildings from being able to be used like they meant to be used. I know what that model looks like. It changed our whole academic outcome. The alumni can come in, adult computer classes, classes for interest, chess club, in addition to the sports and the things that we had. B.J. Rice Hubbard came in and did things for drama. Rashad Pope came in and did things for music. We were able to keep those schools open, a church service on Wednesday, and then on Saturday morning, we were able to do it, folks. And as a result of it, when we got into what was called the Eisenhower Full Service Community School Grant, it gave us $172,000 in order to keep our buildings open after school to do this. As a result, we were able to take kids to New York City, Albany, New York, Staten Island Ferry, Shadow State Legislators and Assemblymen, because we had a building that was open, it was safe, it was secure, we had to focus on what was going on. So I know what it can look like. And so that would be a matter of sitting down collectively with the people in the community, we talk it through, what barriers are in place, and how can we ensure that each school has what it needs because they're all unique. And I don't know all of the schools. That's why I say we is greater than me. What do those principals in that community have to say about that? How can those community partners be involved in that? And what does that look like? And that I would have to sit down and work with my team collectively, especially the people who are here, who have access to, who has access to the budget, who have access to the resources necessary, and find out what is prohibiting that, and where are there examples of this possibly working? And being in Columbus and Cleveland Heights for the last seven years, I'm not as familiar with Akron Public Schools as I would like to. I come to a few books and wrestling matches, or if there's an event for alumni, but ultimately, you know, I would need to know. But those are the things I envision because I've seen a full service community school works, and I know what it can look like. And when you see it, you can believe it because you know it's possible. Thank you. The merger of the Kenmore Garfield cluster was not without controversy. What steps would you take to try to help unify those communities, knowing that they were once rivals? Talk to this gentleman right here who's coaching football and find out what that community needs. No, actually, I'd have to sit down and talk to the principal of the school, talk to the constituents and the parents who've been involved, get in contact with the people here who made the decision, and so that we can be transparent about how that decision was being made, and more importantly, sit down and listen. I don't know if we can change anything that's been done about it at this point, but at least give people a chance to be heard in regards to how they felt about what took place. Sometimes it's just a matter of being heard if we can't solve the situation, but talk to the people who are immediately involved with that because at the Board of Education level, um, sometimes it's difficult to touch that work. So I need to be able to talk with people who are involved in that decision to find out how they felt, um, why the decision was made, and what can we do to try to rectify it in the future? Because it seems like that determination has already been made. Um, and that's just from my perspective, listening to the question. Touch that work. You know, if you touch that work, you know that work. And you have a much better understanding than I do. And listening to what they have to say. Thank you. So Akron has a large immigrant population, particularly in North Akron. What is your experience working with immigrant families? What steps would you take to ensure that the district can meet the needs of those families and support the teachers who have been trying to do so in that area? Um, my experience in that area has been limited to working with the International Society. It used to be located right next to Jennings Middle School. We did not have the volume and the number in regards to the demographics of what takes place, but I understand there are community partners who do have a wealth of knowledge and information about that population who have interpreters so we can sit down and talk with the families, find out what are their wants, what are their needs, what are their barriers. So 
But most importantly, to utilize the people who are already addressing that population on a day to day basis and their expertise in order to find out what's needed because minds have been limited to work with the International Society. I have a friend by the name of Carla Bailey who works with the Department of Interior in Cleveland Heights, where we focus a lot of time on the American Foreign Exchange Student Program. Our kids travel all over the world, South Africa, London, um, other countries. And so Carla was very familiar with that. I will probably call on her because I know that's a year of expertise for her in order to find out what resources are available. But I would use the people's expertise to find out more because I've been limited in experience with that. Thank you. What is your experience with special education? What is your understanding regarding best practices in helping families of special education students feel welcome, wanted, and included in the district? Well, as the principal of Lake Elementary School, over 40% of my population is special education. Orthopedically handicapped, multiple disabilities, other health impaired, ED, LD, cognitively delayed. And that was my first job as a principal. So as a result, I had become very familiar with service code. Service code 13, less than 21% pull out. Service code 14, 21 to 60% uh, pull out, which means they would be in a self contained classroom. The service code 15, which means that they'd be in a self contained classroom almost all day. No Child Left Behind had been fully implemented, so inclusion, for the most part, was really those kids staying in class all day by themselves. I had a hard time talking with my teachers to explain that the students have to come out of the classroom, work with everybody else because these are their peers, whether they have multiple disabilities and they can function cognitively, then guess what? They're going to be in class with everybody else. I don't know why you would think differently. I've never really met a kid walked around with an IEP listed on their forehead. When they come out of life and get grown, they don't have to function just like everybody else, and they function with their peers on a day-to-day -day basis. So my experience with special education started off as an elementary school principal. I know one of the things that we would need to do is look at the accommodations and the things that have been written into the IEP in order to support and form and make a case-by-case -case decision on what's going to be in the best interest, but the parent needs to be at the table. Sometimes an advocate needs to be at the table, and we need to look at those kids' current levels of performance in order to ensure that they're getting grade level rigor. Because now all IEPs are supposed to be written, written at grade level, not writing something to say you're going to learn four or five facts when, in fact, the third grade standard is, especially if that student is capable. You know, if a student's copy delayed, there's certain things we have to do in order to make accommodations, but ultimately, when we have a student who's listed as SLD or ED, et cetera, and things of that nature, we need to make sure that those IPs are written to help those kids meet or exceed grade level expectations. And also, you see the director of pupil services. So, as a result, we had to do all the 504 plans. Any, um, excuse me, any parents who filed an appeal in regards to things that they disagreed with in regards to a student's IEP. And so, I handled all of those grievances. Um, so, I think it's important that we train up our teachers on how to have the same expectations for the students that we serve. We don't want to set that bar so low that the kids are tripping over it or so high that they're not reaching for it and can't reach it. But we have to find out that medium in order to make it work. But the expectation is still the same. You're going to read well, write well, speak well, most importantly, critically think, and you're going to be able to function out here in society. Great, thank you. Scenario for you. Uh, you're at the engagement center when a parent comes in asking what steps he or she needs to take uh, or they're, while they're switching their child to a charter school due to their dissatisfaction with APS. How would you respond to or approach that parent? Would you try to convince that parent to give APS a chance? Why or why not? Absolutely. I'm proud of the Akron Public Schools, but I would definitely want to find out their why. Why is it that you are leaving and moving from the Akron Public Schools? What is it that we did or we didn't do in order for you to make this decision? Can I have a principal come in and sit down and talk with your staff members? Has your voice been heard? What is going on? Because I recognize that we lose a substantial number of dollars to charter schools or educational voucher programs because many parents are dissatisfied with the level of professionalism or the level or the treatment that they're getting in some of our buildings. I recognize it. I'm just telling the truth. And so as a result of it, we have to sit down and find out what was your why? 
why is it that you chose to do something else when in fact I wrote an article in the um it was the Cant repository called Why Do They Leave? And it talked about parents leaving brand new buildings with new computer labs and to take an option or take a chance on a charter school that was an old church with no air conditioning because of their level of dissatisfaction with what we were providing. And so therefore we have to provide a quality product, but at the same time, I'm gonna listen. What is your why? Try to convince you and find out what it is that we need to do. And if we can't, you always have to do what's in the best interest of your students, but I definitely want you to be here. Um, so yes, I would try to keep them in the Akron Public Schools. I would definitely try to find out their why. I let them know that we're gonna be here when you come back, because a lot of them do come back. But ultimately, I would sit down and try to figure out what was going on talk to that principal or that school, find out if it was staff, and what can we do in order to ensure that we've been doing what we're supposed to be doing for this child. But ultimately, parents have to make a decision for what they believe is gonna be best. I just wanna make sure our product is one that wants to make kids stay here as opposed to leave. Thank you. Parent family engagement and involvement is something that APS has repeatedly said and would like to see improve. How would you respond to parents, caregivers, who say that they simply have too much on their plate to be involved? What ideas do you have for programs, resources, etc., mm -hmm. to make APS more parent caregiver friendly? Um, repeat the first part of the question, Mr. Hort. Um, sure. Uh, parent family engagement and involvement is something APS has repeatedly said it would like to improve. How would you respond to parents and caregivers? who say that they simply have too much on their plate to be involved. Um, they're probably telling the truth. I've got a lot on my plate too. I don't make it all my daughter's events and things of that nature. But what I would do is what I've seen happen is in the Kansas City schools, we have what was called school community workers, who are people who live within the community, knew the community, had a vested interest in the community, and they help do things like alumni events, or so bring the alumni back to the school, we had cookouts at the beginning of the year. We had what was called the Hartford, um, the Hartford uh, Festival. And, and, and find out what it is that's keeping the parents from being in the building. But more importantly, what we decided to do is I'm going where the parents are at. If the parents feel uncomfortable coming into the school or don't have the time to get into the school, then where can we meet you? What can we do in the community? Where are you at in order to meet you where you're at? The other thing I would say is because of the use of Zoom and technology, now we have the ability in order to meet parents in a variety of different ways. You don't necessarily have to come into the school, but I can set up a Zoom meeting and can get a link so that therefore we have the ability to talk. We can schedule those every week. We can schedule them monthly. Another thing I saw, one of the best superintendents I know, and I spoke about it before, is Dr. Talisa Dixon. And Dr. Dixon set up community cafes. So once a month, she would go into the community at the coffee shop, sit down, invite parents to come on in and have a conversation. She set up things with student ambassadors, so that therefore the parents, excuse me, the student ambassadors were able to have meetings with her in order to talk about discussions that would take place with parents. And we do the best we can in order to get them involved because the reality of the situation is many parents are working some two jobs and just coming out of COVID. So how can we use the technology that's available in order to enhance what they need? How can we get feedback on what the parents want from us? That's one of the first things we need to do. What do you want from us and how can we communicate with you effectively? So those are some ideas and some things that I think of based on some of the experiences that I've had. Great, thank you. So in a world focused on STEM and a district centered on college and career readiness, what role do the fine arts and fine and performing arts play in the education of all students, not just those who attend the performing arts schools? Well, I would say everything is not for everybody. And for those kids who want to focus in those fine arts and all the things like that, we need to definitely make sure we have a resource available for them to do that. But I would say this specifically, at our elementary schools, we need to make sure kids are exposed to the fine arts, drama, performing arts, multimedia, instruments, orchestra, violin, trumpets. I learned to play trumpet in the fifth grade, at a clarinet in the third grade. I thank God for those opportunities because it gave me a love for music. How do we get our kids to the tri C Jazz Fest so therefore they get a chance to see these type of things? That's why when you say on my last slide, exposure changes expectations. Because the experiences we provide kids to change lives, 
we need to provide those type of experiences. I went to a liberal arts college where we had to take fine arts. We had to learn film crit. We had to learn uh, Renaissance art. We had like, like, why do I have to learn all of this stuff? But it made me a more well-rounded individual. So I believe at the elementary level, we have to make sure we provide experiences, or excuse me, exposure to experiences that will change the lives and broaden these students' minds in regards to what they actually can be. You got the Tri-C Jazz Fest. You got the Cleveland Film Festival. You got uh, performing art stages that used to be right over there by uh, the Women's City Club. You know, you got the Civic Theater. Our kids need to be exposed to all of these things in order to be a more well-rounded individual because we're living in a global society and our kids need to know more than just their neighborhood. So I think that fine art plays a tremendous role because you find students who may struggle academically but give them an instrument, they're fine. They struggle academically but allow them to be in a play and a drama, they're fine. Give them a, a camera, they're allowed to make movies and do different things, they're fine, but they may be struggling academically. And I think everybody has to find out what works for them. And the only way we can do that as an educational system is to provide experiences that will help them um, do that. Great. We have time for one last question here. And that is, tell us about someone who was an important mentor to you and how they influenced your leadership style. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Marshall Johnson, who was the assistant superintendent in the Alliance City School. He motivated me to go to graduate school and get my master's degree. The gentleman spoke seven different languages. Um, anytime I had an idea, he allowed me to pursue my ideas, bump my head if I made a mistake. Um, and he just made a tremendous impact because he's one of the people that pushed me into um, administration. Uh, one of the young ladies that kept me on a straight and narrow in regards to example of professionalism is over in the corner right there, uh, Dr. Randall Dees, Dees Randall. But I just always, you know, was enamored with the way she carried herself as a professional and the respect that she demanded no matter where she went because she was consistent in Sunday coming after Saturday. And so Marshall was probably the person who helped me when I was 25, began to see the importance of uh, where I could go and the importance of going back. He's the person that pushed me to go to graduate school in order to pursue educational administration. Um, and those are some of the people I think about off the top of my head who really made a tremendous difference. Well, Mac, we appreciate your time here and everything that you shared. And we are at the end of our time together. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for everybody coming. Thank you to all of you. You've been so dedicated in being here and meeting the candidates, and that has meant so much. Uh, so, uh, again, take advantage of the online surveys, provide your feedback. Um, and so, the, the board has quite a task coming up to uh, make this final decision, but uh, all your input is for them. And have a great rest of the night and a great weekend. Thank you.